Okay, I think uh, we can probably get started. There's quite a few people on the call and uh, people that are joining late can just catch up afterwards. Um, so thanks everyone for joining. This is the CNF working group in case you got lost and stumbled into the wrong conference room. Uh, we meet weekly uh, Mondays at 1600 UTC. Um, and this is our first meeting for this year. Um, so before we jump into the uh, agenda items. Is there anything that anyone wants to add or likes to would like to see uh, before we get started? I do see that uh, anonymous wombat is adding uh, chaos experiments. That's me, Mr. Taylor. Ah, okay. Sure. Um, and. If nothing has any, if nobody has anything else to add, I guess we can uh, jump right into the agenda then. Um, so first on the agenda um, is Vuk. I think he's on the call, right? Yes, I'm there. I'm present. Okay. Uh, so your discussion item was about this discussion that you started about uh, CNF ca can candidates for assessment. Uh, would you like to? Like kick it off. Do you want me to open it for you? Would you like to share your screen? Um, no, actually, I didn't uh, didn't make much uh, out of that. I um, wanted originally to initiate the discussion uh, as we are putting uh, us in in position to make some best practices and then some um, uh, some rules for for evaluation of the cloud native network functions. I thought some of the, the developers uh, of the network functions uh, might candidate their own uh, projects to actually also interact or uh, not only to define the best practices uh, and uh, the, the requirements, but also to, uh, uh, to do that uh, um, uh, by having in, in sight a couple of, I'm not saying like long list of the application, but a couple of very concrete ones uh, that we can use as a, as a basis for, for aspiring on, on these uh, best practices. So really to do the, the concrete evaluations of the, of the concrete functions as we develop best practices. And then it would serve us potentially to fine tune, uh, um, to choose if some best practices really uh, are relevant and meaningful and some practices are not uh, in, in that sense. Um, just to have a little bit uh, a concrete uh, um, basis for uh, discussion, because I, I felt um, uh, so far we have been fairly on a, on a high level, uh, and then um, I thought it might be good to, to uh, if somebody of the developers would candidate their network functions with a which they uh, consider maybe very much cloud native or even some that are having some issues uh, with that so that we can run them through the best practices. I wanted to start this discussion in the, in the forums, but obviously due to the holiday season, there was no much traction on it. Yeah, absolutely, thanks. Um, so is there, uh, any one who's either there a CNF vendor or developer that would like to volunteer one of their CNFs that we can actually have some kind of like world, real world assessment about this or know some, it also doesn't have to be immediately. Uh, you can also say, I wanna take time and reach out to some people I know um, to see if they'd be interested. I mean, also open question in the round here. Uh, what do you think about that uh, as, a, as an element of our work here? You know, is there some opinion on that one? Maybe it's the right uh, uh, avenue to, to go, maybe it's not. So I just want to throw it in the round. Hello, this is Victor Morales. Um, I just have a question regarding this. Um, so the idea that you have is basically um, to list or to reference the the CNF 
from here to the projects or because uh, what I have seen is like, at least in the CNF test best project, there is a couple of examples where we can kind of uh, use it or yeah, I think Taylor put it some information there. <laughs> um, so anyway, probably I can put the same comments in the discussion to have it there. Or, or but for now is 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 that what you have in mind? Like uh, at least to reference those CNF from from the repository. I don't know that uh, repository. Maybe I'm just looking now. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's it. So I can I can take a look. Uh, we'll need a bit uh, time, but yeah, they. they there could be these. Uh, what I see on the layer, maybe I, I just take a, a review if you can put uh, the link. Uh, uh, maybe that's uh, what I meant. I was more uh, on, not more, but I was in general looking towards having a well defined uh, and, and uh, let's say packaged, productized. Uh, uh, CNF that somebody uh, of the developers, vendors, open source project uh, has, and then use it as a as a Super. real uh, life check uh, for the for the assessment. So essentially, trying to do assessments uh, according to the to the best practices we uh, generate. Like there is one uh, uh, that um, was sent about the operator view, platform view, the assessment sheet that's in the in the Google drive uh, using these uh, these uh, statements these criteria using the the best practice criteria and then, then just checking but i'll look at this uh, page and uh, we'll review a couple of those and then provide the feedback if these are uh, actually those that i meant would be uh, useful okay yeah I I think uh, maybe maybe some of uh, just uh, to do, uh, add to that maybe some of uh, say more challenging uh, functions, for example, taking a, a um, 5G core data plane intensive function uh, or, or, or something like that uh, to use uh, to provide the, the, the borderline case because these are from the practice appearing as the most problematic or not problematic, but most uh, challenging ones to fit into the, let's say, normal standard Kubernetes model. Um, I think that there's also, um, we, we probably want to go over more than one uh, in this, like we want to start with one, but there's, there's, different, uh, there's different models, there's different types of, uh, of common um, threads that we're, that we're gonna see here that um, that we may want to investigate and check against that particular pattern. So for example, uh, you may have one that is very heavy around, uh, around uh, how, how, pa uh, how a packet core may work and, and that those have certain assumptions and certain uh, control plane assumptions that are, that are made, then you may have Others that are that are uh, completely separate, but uh, don't don't have the same level of requirements on on the control plane uh, that uh, frees up to to how how do we build and, and manage it without having to bring in all of the uh, and I, I don't want to use the word legacy, but all of the assumptions that you that you would tend to have in in a packet core environment. And that to see what the differences are like. If you're bringing in a, a, a firewall as, as a CNF, then uh, the control plane requirements are very different from something like a like a packet core. So uh, we so we should make sure that we over time we go over more uh, over more uh, types of environments to uh, to see not only uh, not only how are the same, but where where, where do they differ as well while still uh, focusing on on that Kubernetes on being that Kubernetes native style uh, approach.
Duke, are you, uh, were you only interested in open source projects? Open source uh, products that are um, also open source? Uh, not only necessarily. Um, they could be uh, also the, the commercial ones because I think it's a uh, um, probably prevailing uh, model for those uh, bigger functions. But for that, we would need the developers who would uh, be ready and who would know the details of those and then can um, answer the, the, the questions, can, can check whether uh, the patterns uh, that we are defining are um, sustainable for that function or, or uh, not. And that could be a trigger uh, for some discussions. Uh, why not and, and what holds us from uh, or hold that particular developer vendor uh, from uh, adhering to these best practices. I was just really looking for how to get to the good discussions on a, on a concrete point. But we could start from the open source ones. Um, it's probably going to be easier. So on the open source side, um, we can probably map a lot of the applications, but those may those are likely to end up being one part of a product. Whenever mm -hmm. the, the CNF is actually um, deployed and sold, as far as a production CN, uh, CNF network function, so. The list that I put in there that's um, from either if we're going to like the examples from CNF testbed, the ex the list of examples on the test suite, that first one that Bill had opened up, where you go look at NSM examples, those are all mm -hmm. the smaller components and stuff of what you may see for the most part unless you look at a use case. I mean, if, if you look at a use case instead of a product, then we could probably take apart the different pieces and go, oh, here's a single application, like the VSP use case, you're gonna have um, the AAA and DHCP and a lot of other pieces that you have to have. So those are part of it. Um, and then you have like the different gateways and those could be if if you're thinking about a kubernetes based deployment then ideally someone could you could have different vendors providing the different um if desired you could you could get different pieces of that use case from different places so you may actually have your um gateway at one end that's from someone and you don't care that it's not from the same vendor because it all works together. But that would be going from like a use case and then breaking it down. Otherwise, it would be nice to get some CNF developers that are able to speak to it, like you're saying, Book. If I mean, if you look, you're saying we need to to be able to have access to code more than having people available to answer questions Correct. and talk to us about, um, are we coming up with best practices that are gonna help them as developers, whether that's a app, app developer or platform um, developers or ops team, do we have the people that can give feedback on, on the best practices that we're discussing? Yeah, correct. And in some later stage, uh, hopefully then uh, bring the artifacts in certain reference environment and uh, also be able to uh, to do the test, to run the test uh, against that. Um, if we, let's say, progress towards that uh, compliance uh, approach. Uh, on the other side, if you're looking, uh, what the results, what these best practices uh, could be used for. And there was a discussion around the PR. Uh, 
which was uh, around the initial framework. Um, yeah, I think that leads into our next discussion. Yeah, the potentially, pot potentially, uh, I just wanted to, to reflect why is that uh, uh, interesting. Uh, so if we have a good job done here, uh, then many operators will take this list, uh, like uh, today for the security things around Kubernetes, you go and take a, a CIS list and say, okay, this is what I want uh, every uh, vendor, supplier, uh, whatever to fulfill, and then you put it in your RFQs. Uh, so ideally, if we did a good job uh, after some time and have a set of best practices, many operators will take them and put them in the RFQs when they're choosing the, the or RFPs uh, when they're choosing the network functions, uh, cloud native network functions. Uh, and if we create something that is disqualifying uh, or that is reducing, uh, feasibility for many network functions due to reasons that we didn't evaluate on a, on a practical uh, and concrete examples, then we might uh, cause some, uh, yeah, some, some, some challenges or some problems to those. So that would be really inter interesting to have a dialogue on that. And when something we believe is a, is a best practice and should be done uh, a certain way, is not supported broadly then to understand why and then see you know is that then a best practice or not or, or uh, is there actually advice uh, how uh, the limitations of the cnf could be uh, overcome so th this is uh, all the sense of of searching for a concrete examples and a concrete uh, dialogue with the with the developers yeah, absolutely. I think that kind of, so if anybody has any um, ideas of who wants to contribute to the discussion or candidate CNFs, uh, please feel free to add it to uh, the discussion item uh, here in the repo. And then uh, that kind of leads into our next um, uh, uh, item uh, on the agenda is the, Kind of the initial framework. Uh, so thanks once again, Robbie, for putting this together. I know um, Vuk has uh, you, there's a couple open uh, things here, but has everybody had a time to look through this, or does anybody feel like they need like more time um, to look through this? Uh, it's Dan from Bell. I'd say a bit more time coming back from holidays, so uh, maybe next time. Okay, um, so I think we can probably leave it open one more week and try to get it merged by next week. Um, is there anything that anybody wants to discuss uh, specifically <coughs> specifically right now? I mean, I, I, a few comments need to be added, right? I'll have a look at that and trying to make sure others didn't go in a few days. Okay. And Robbie, is there anything you'd like to bring up right now about this PR that you created? Um, please approve it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, th I think I'm hoping this uh, PR will clear this initial framework. So ideally speaking, this will be the, the framework that uh, we will base our contribution on. So I really encourage everybody to look at that. And once approved, uh, I'm hoping to follow. Uh, the scheme that proposed by this PR. So make sure we, we do our work uh, more efficiently afterwards. Um, I'm going to say what I've been saying before, which is this limits our scope if we put it the way, you know, and literally first time I've read it for apologies, but uh, it limits our scope if the first thing we say is um, it's a question of making sure that CNFs are compliant against best practices because the best practices have to have reasons behind them. So there is a bigger problem to solve before you can start saying CNF should be built this way, I think. Um, so actually, I think if we jump down to uh, the, actually it's not here, but the, uh, the descriptions, um, but actually, each of the like templates actually does have or does ask you to list the reasons uh, why each of them should be so. So 
there's goals, non-goals, like the user stories um, and why. So yeah. if you think something else should be included in here. Well, no, I mean, that's fine. But normally when I'm writing a document like that, then I'm saying here is my motivation. Here is the goal that I'm looking for. Here is the thing I'm looking to accomplish. And then I refer out to why that goal is a laudable one, why it's the, the one that we should be aiming for. So where do I refer out to? So just to just to clarify, so we actually decoupled the best practices from the actual uh, documents. So what that really allows allow anybody to propose a best practice, and as long as they can prove that there's enough uh, data to back up why they think this is a best practice, it, it it will go. And this is the template that Bill is is showing. And if you feel there's any more information you would like to see for any best practice before it can be validated and it's promoted to be approved as a best practice we're gonna base the certification on so this is something we can include in the template if you well so. well I, i'm i'm not really i think i mean if if what we're doing here is best practices that's perfectly acceptable i'm saying what do we consider authoritative references for um uh for motivations so for instance to give an example um if I assume that all my CNFs are going to run on Maltus, then I want someone to have made a, an informed and reasoned choice in that is documented for with their reasoning somewhere else. So that when I say, well, I test it's running on Maltus like this, that and the other, then I've got a reason to be testing for that and a reason for the best practice to be acceptable. Bad example, but I'm trying to get to that point. I'd like to um, add one more thing to this is um, one of my, um, you know, one thing that makes me nervous is despite this whole, everybody thinks they're agile now, um, the service provider world likes to play at it, but like certain things just don't conform well to being quote unquote agile. So what happens, what is gonna be our process if a best practice six months from now turns out to not be a best practice or this and that, like how are we gonna prevent like the road that Etsy went down where they wrote a bunch of arbitrary things down at the beginning. And then it was like, we are never, ever, ever changing these. Um, especially kind of to Ian's point, if we're saying that you should be building to these best practices and one of them is debunked, like how do we keep developer trust when we say we need to like go back on this or we need to modify, like you might have to start changing, you know, X, Y, or Z part of your development if you want to keep following quote unquote best practices. So if this is the direction we're going to take, I, I think that we definitely need to make sure we establish a set of principles and say like, these are things we tend to look for in general, regardless of technologies, um, such as the system should be able to uh, withstand a, uh, a container or a pod dying without losing service, as a, without losing a, a significant service or degradation. Or uh, we, can, we can come up with other general high level things, but when it comes down to low level implementation details, we have to be a little bit careful here and to give you a really good example, uh, then, and not, in the, uh, not as much in the uh, container space, but let's say you're talking about like best practices for maintaining a car. You may say best practice of maintaining a car is to make sure that you fill it with the right set of gas and, and fill it with the right set of oil. But then what does that mean if you're driving a Tesla? It's like you, you end up with a different set of best practices for, for it, even though they are, they're still fundamentally a, uh, a car. And so we need to be careful that we, that we uh, don't fall into the same trap. And instead we, we list what is the principle uh, we we want to make sure this thing is well maintained, or we want to make sure this thing as well uh, is able to scale, or so on. But then, when we list when we list the best practice, that is is it based upon a high level principle, or is this something that is covering a, an implementation detail? Like if your if your environment is uh, if your CNF is multis and it has these conditions, then these best practices occur, and that there's a set of appropriate conditions so that when someone comes along with uh, something they want to install with, with Danem, or they want to, or maybe something that uh, bypasses all of that and, and adds it in with NSM, 
then you know in what context that best practice applies in order to in order to apply it. And you're getting with something that's a bit concrete, and we can circle around and say the in order to achieve this principle, these are these are requirements or not requirements. Uh, it's too strong of a word, but these are best. These are some best practices that may exemplify this particular property. It's not the only path. There's other paths that may may be. Ill- that may be appropriate that are not listed, but there there are things you can use as a as a reference to to get there. So if if we're going to head towards that that practice, we 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 may use something like that. That could be something we could use for a framework. I did put in a PR specifically for us adding a section for providing context, um, just because of what you were describing, um, Frederick. My main concern though is if we change something and we say you know it turns out that this doesn't actually um, support a principle like we thought it would, right? Um, my big fear is is um, it'll be kind of like what we had in VNFs where like the quote unquote best practices, the requirements, the standards, et cetera, weren't really feasible in the real world. And so most developers rolled their eyes and just said, I'm gonna build what I think works, right? Um, and if we yank the rug out from people a bunch, they're probably not gonna take our group very serious because uh, it'll be impossible to adhere to. Um, so I'm just kind of curious, like as you know, so let's say we adopt Robbie's um, framework, which is fine with me. Um, I would, like Daniel would like to read it one more time, but um, let's say we go down a path. Um, I just want to make sure that we leave ourselves out, that we have the ability to self-reflect and correct things as this space evolves. If a you know new technology comes out that maybe even makes us reevaluate a principle, um, I would like us to like have a plan for that in advance versus you know, we get something that's broken later on and we don't have a way to self-correct. Yeah, that's a good point. And in terms of something like Etsy, we have an advantage here because the things that we're developing, as I don't believe this is a standards body, even though we are, even though it may end up informing standards bodies. And this is an important uh, distinction because when you start looking at what does it mean to be a standard, that we're enti- you have entire uh, countries that have explicitly stated that uh, there will not be any change in, in this within, in, order, in order to make it reasonable. And the end result was that you end up with a lot of stuff upfront added to Etsy on the off chance something might be useful as opposed to actively being useful. And as a net result, a large portion of things that were listed within Etsy were never implemented. Uh, they were just added in on the off chance that, uh, that they may be useful. And so we, we should be careful in, in this that we're, we're not falling into the, same, into the same trap because we wanna list things that are common. And one of the things that we could do is put a priority towards things that we see in uh, in development or or practice, where if we see if we're not seeing any active uh, implementation or we're not seeing any active development, but we're something that is aspirational, then we should explicitly state that. But if we see something that is that is gaining a lot of traction, and we write something that is a best practice surrounding it, then we should explicitly, then at that point, we, we can treat that differently than, than something that has no actual implementation behind it. So, but yeah, that's, that's gonna be a challenge uh, is trying to work out how to, how to ensure that you, you get that, that change. And I think that's more of a process, um, more of a process problem. So one way, you, you've got two things there, I think. One is where do we source our best practices from again? Um, you know, what evidence we have that this would make a good best practice. Um, And the other is, given a best practice, how do we get feedback on it so that if it turns out that it's counterproductive, we remove it from our preference list? It seems to me, uh, we need to come back to the point, add a sentence around the process of approving a best practice or change it, and just put some criteria around that. I'm happy to propose a draft yep. of that as well. Okay, Robbie, I'm gonna put you in the notes for that then, thank you. 
It's one B. Otherwise, I will be out of body. <laughs> Sorry. I don't. I don't think from the. If you look at the perspective of like, a cap the Kubernetes enhancement proposals or Python or Ruby Rails, where different projects that are have a healthy organic um, way of adding new things and modifying new things, it's, it's part of the process. So if you are saying that something's problematic, you ideally see it before it fully gets to the point of implementation as, as a enhancement. So for us, that would mean before we endorse it as a best practice. But for those that you don't, what happens is they have a history on a cap and they go, we're refactoring this. Or they'll have, similar to RFCs, you'll have a new one that comes out that addresses things that are missing. And then you can also deprecate. Likewise, RFCs where one is completely deprecated and no longer recommended. I don't think from that perspective that we have a problem as long as we don't add additional rules and and process that blocks those things ideally anyone could bring something up and and start talking about an existing best practice and problems we can move that into a discussion start working through it if we see it as a problem then we can move forward on potentially deprecating a best practice or maybe modifying it. Um, Jeffrey, you've talked about adding context saying where it may be a problem in some situations, but perfectly fine in others. So that's something that we may do after the fact. You may have a best practice that everyone agreed to, looks great. And then as we get going, either because things change in the world or we just hadn't had someone speak up, you find it, it doesn't work in some situations and we can always add to the best practice content so that that's known. Man, yeah, I don't disagree that certain groups do this better than others. Um, like I said, the big thing though is there could be like big course corrections. Like anybody who's followed IPv6 for a really long time in Kubernetes knows that like, we all know that the shoe's eventually gonna drop and it's going to be awkward. Like there's disagreement on how IPv6 should be implemented, just networking in general. You know, it was very web centric at the beginning. And then other people wanted to use Kubernetes for things. And they're like, oh, now we need things like egress gateways, all this stuff. Right. And, um, you know, I would say that like KubeSig and others have done a good job of, you know, addressing these. But um, that doesn't mean that like the transitions have been as painless as we would like them. Um, and like I said, even if we know that there's good models for us to follow, we should pick one of those models and call it out because I've also seen other groups, you know, just assume that, yeah, we'll be fine. And then it didn't work out the way they wanted to, like technical debt, you know, mounted up to the point where like, maybe we just need to completely start from scratch, things like that. So like I said, I just, maybe some of this is a little bit of um, anxiety based on past experiences, but like, you know, I know at some point I have to, look at how we're going to do IPv6 and Kubernetes and then or specifically dual stack. And additionally, um, you know, I've seen other organizations where they didn't have a smooth process to, you know, something like Ruby on Rails or something where it was much, much more painful, or they just said it's not worth it. We're just not going to change and everybody's going to keep running off the cliff like a lemming. Yeah, the uh, Kubernetes uh, example also has the added constraint that they had some a single major code base to to work around with uh, an initial set of, of use cases, um, being the standard Kubernetes uh, workloads that you see. And we we're we're going to run into a few problems with that in that we don't have such a such a thing like we can't, there's no reference uh, architecture that we will be able to point to and say, this is the one, this is the, the one path. Uh, like we're already seeing a, uh, a variety of different approaches that, uh, that are occurring, each with different set of, of uh, different principles and constraints that, uh, that are being deployed. And, and so 
like we that that's part of the reason I mentioned about the the conditions before as well. Like if, if you're running in this style of environment, then what are what are possible what are possible best practices? But you also need a way to back up as well. So as you learn more or the environment changes, then we're we're not stuck with those. Uh, and there's also there's also issues around what uh, what decisions have been made within a given organization. So even in a standard Kubernetes environment, when you start looking at things like best practices, you know, you pick up something as innocuous as a CNI. If I choose, uh, if, if back in the day, if I chose Flannel as my CNI versus maybe uh, OpenShift CNI versus uh, uh, something like uh, uh, you know some of the some of the other CNIs that have come along, such as Weave. Uh, that they ended up with significantly different best set of practices, even just to maintain it, uh, much less how they approached the development of their of their environment. And all of them were were rational ways to, to approach it. They just made different decisions based upon their their requirements and, and technologies. And we, if you if you look at the uh, best practices that came around Kubernetes, they ended up with three simple rules, and those three simple rules were: nodes can talk to other nodes, pods can talk to pods, and nodes can talk to pods. And as long as you met those three conditions, then you're uh, has a CNI, uh, along with some of the basic contracts that were added, like you give your IP back and a couple other minor things then you were pretty much set and, and good to go. And it was hands off uh, primarily on how do you actually achieve it. And I think we're, we're trying to be much more aggressive here in saying that, well, we want to state these are the best practices. And then we say, okay, well, best practices in, in relationship to, to what? And that's why we want to start with what are the, what are the principles? Like we want, we want to be horizontally scalable. We want to be robust. We want to be uh, and, the, and the question even comes down to why. Like uh, Ian had a really great point from uh, previous sort of conversations we had that if you delivered a, a, a box and that box had uh, met all of your requirements for uptime and you could access it through a very common API, do you care whether or not it's, uh, it, it's designed in a very specific way? And so, so maybe we should even get down to the, what are we trying to do? Like we're trying to achieve certain types of SLA. We're trying to achieve certain types of, of ways to consume it through a, uh, through a cloud native API. And then we can say, if you are implementing it, this with these constraints, then these are some of the best practices and go tap some of the communities to, to go deal with that. So we can go tap the, uh, the Multis and the Danim and the NSM communities and say, well, can you give us some examples of things that exemplify best practices and go and uh, talk about how those how those are approached and also other areas we can also take a look at them from use cases like the requirements of putting together a firewall or a VPN and managing a, a Kubernetes based uh, firewall or VPN are going to be much different from best practices surrounding how do you maintain a, a evolved packet core on on your system. The, the requirements are, are fundamentally different uh, down to the point it's like, what is the difference between managing an op, uh, a database versus managing a, a microservice website? Uh, that they're both valid use cases within Kubernetes, but they're substantially different in their approach that you have to make different decisions in order to, in order to ensure the health of the application that, that's running on it. Um, so some, just some things to think about. Um, Vuk speaking, one uh, comment on um, uh, the depreciation of the best practices. Uh, that's a very valid aspect that we have to take with uh, uh, very carefully and very seriously, especially due to that uh, past experiences, not only with, uh, with uh, Etsy and VNF, but uh, many other approaches like that. Uh, this was one of the reasons that motivates me uh, to bring that first point in. Um, as long as we have a concrete functions and concrete pieces of code in the discussion and having it be directional uh, dialogue or being ready to depreciate, uh, deprecate certain uh, best practices, if in the dialogue we found out, okay, it's really blocking meaningful things and it doesn't contribute uh, to uh, 
I don't know, better SLA or better uptime and, and, and so on, then it's up to community to really uh, focus uh, on deprecating that. But we will only find or mostly find that uh, um, by uh, confronting the rules um, with the concrete examples. The problem with Etsy was that there was a lot of writing in a point in time, as uh, was rightfully said, and that there was no willingness on consideration, but was just pushing, or not just pushing, but there was a lot of like, okay, this is a framework, please fit to that. And then the, the, the feedback from the developers that uh, uh, was said here were rolling their eyes, this rolling of eyes didn't end up in the process of um, uh, reviewing, uh, does that what we do uh, or what they do there uh, make sense uh, and how it has to be uh, uh, re-evaluated. That's very important to, to uh, factor in uh, here. And an, an, another piece um, uh, that, uh, that was mentioned is like black box uh, thing. And I, I am reiterating and I was reiterating in a, in a chat. Um, there could be a two purposes of that. One is completely developer centric. And that should go like how to use cloud native patterns and how to use Kubernetes to the maximum and, and uh, um, possible extent uh, to make a best function, package it in the box and deliver it. Um, from the operator side, from the uh, side of the of the um, actors that are consuming that, that's still called black box. You can put whatever ASICs proprietary hardware in it. That would be all all same. Uh, the other approach or other uh, way to do that uh, is really saying, okay, do we as the operators? I'm talking from the operator angle. Want to establish a generic cloud layer for those functions? and onboard the network functions on that cloud layer and give the functionalities and the possibilities to those functions uh, to be able to, to run as they were supposed to run. Uh, and I think the, the, the value of doing a cloud native principles is at least for, for uh, that perspective uh, of operator that I have a generic or more or less generic infrastructure that runs in X, Y, Z uh, locations, and the CNFs are onboarding on that one. And the set of best practices is a contract, is a kind of sort of contract between these kind of uh, infrastructures and the uh, CNFs. Just wanna uh, wanted to reflect on that because for for a black box. Um, I think black post, whatever it is inside, uh, nobody wants to care. Except developers who are making that black box to be the best possible. Spe speaking as the supplier to a bunch of very inquisitive customers, I'm not sure that's true. But um, perhaps what we're saying here is rather than the what the document currently says, you know, we will define best practices in light of other people, other definitions of cloud native. We should say we will define best practices. That's one avenue of attack, but we've got other things to deal with as well. I think we're ruling things out that we should have within our remit. What exactly do you mean by that, Ian? Can you, can you rephrase it? Well, so what specifically are you concerned about that? we're leaving out or that you're thinking we're leaving out? So, I mean, we've, the, the, the points keep coming up um, there, right? That we don't have a platform definition because we don't know what a good CNF is. Um, you know, a well-behaved CNF following a standardized and singular platform definition as an example. Um, we talk about cloud native as if it has meaning without context you know the words mean we know exactly what a cnf cloud native cnf looks like and those principles exist elsewhere and i don't think they do so um rather than saying we will do the lowest layer of this we'll do the the implementation the thing that describes here is a c here is a cloud native best practice here's how, here is how you demonstrate that it exists in a given cnf we also say here is not just the test for the thing we're looking for but here is why that thing is a best practice in the first place here is 
our thoughts on why it should be a best practice, not necessarily, um, you know, hoping that turns up in another group. Those, the why, why something should be a best practice is explicitly part of the proposal process. So starting with the, the discussion board. So you're discussing something and uh, the discussion board of course can be other things. So we have like the actors and stuff, but the, when you're, someone is bringing up a potential best practice or maybe within a discussion it is, ideally part of the conversation would say, here is why we think this is a best practice. Yeah, but if, 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 if I were writing software in mm -hmm. an old fashioned way, and you know, even if we're doing agile, this still exists, right? We have requirements, design, implementation. The implementation meets the design and the design meets the requirements. But what we have here is implementation with a bunch of hopefully some requirements thrown in for good measure. But that means that you know, individual best practices are considered individually, not necessarily sourced from the same set of, you know, a consistent set of requirements or a consistent idea of design. Um, you have to build down to the level we want to be at. Here are testable things we can examine. So we're not doing this in a vacuum, which it sounds like you're implying that. Well, no, I, and I, I've, asked, I've asked, uh, that's true, but I've asked before, what are our, where's our design? Where's our requirements coming from? If, if we were building all of this from scratch, if you just came in and said, we're going to build software and operators just start using it and just, you want things to run. Okay. That's all we, we're not doing that. We're not, we're not starting completely from scratch. We're, we're building off of existing applications. So that's related to putting the discussion for it on CNF candidates. So that's right. working from that level backwards. Um, We've already listed in the actor, and hold on a moment. And if you go look at the actor discussion, one of the items that was brought forward was platform developers or vendors, whatever you want to call uh, those, wherever they are. So those people would be involved. Architects designing from maybe within the, a, a, at an actual um, service provider that may be designing the overall yeah. architecture. Yeah. So you're going to have all of those people engaged, but it doesn't mean that we have to have all of that done before we even start because we already know that part of it's going to be based off of what's out there. So the, the BGP speaker, are we going to say those are no longer useful immediately? You, you'd probably argue that those are going to exist for a while. Or a, I'm, I, I'm fine, mm -hmm. but the, yes, I, if you want to design this stuff and you're a little bit short on the, on the why of what you're doing, BGP speaker is an example, right? Then where would I put down the why? Where do I put that down? And I don't mean as, as in the same way that I try not to write code and hope everybody understands what the requirements were that drove me to write it. I'm saying, where would the abstract requirements go when we get those actors together? Or yeah, where does a, a user story fall short on your why? If you were to capture what you're saying in the user story, the user's pain or whatever it is I, I, I right now for BGP a user or whatever. Story to, exp uh, to be explained for the first time in a, what is looking to me like a test or a test description is my problem. Well, we're talking about the requirement, the driver for a requirement. So if you're out there developing any system at all and yeah. you go out and you get user stories, right? Yeah. You say, this is a user, this is what they're doing, this is a problem, whatever it is. Yeah. And now you're going to build your requirements based on that user story. What, where you got the requirements, which could come after the user story. You can look at the user story as a requirement either way. But what, where are you not capturing what you, you are talking about? I'm, I'm really saying that the user story stands independent of the conclusions you draw from it. Yes, that's correct. So you have the why in the user story. 
Are you saying the conclusion is the why, or what are you saying? I, I'm saying I, I'm saying the conclusion stands independent of the user story. So, if we have a user story, would it not make more sense to keep it separate from the conclusions we draw from it, rather than embed it in every single conclusion? Because the proposals we seem to have here, um, the the things we will be filling out as templates are conclusions, recommendations, the final, the final element of the implementation. So fair enough. If you were, so if the user stories were separate, right, but you referred to the user stories and that's what we say, okay, here's our why you need to have a real world description of something you want and point back to that. And then you have the, and then you point to it instead of having it in directly embedded in there, that would kind of satisfy what you're talking about. Yeah, effectively uh, um, having a home for those things, um, okay. independent of the the things that we the, the recommended you know tests or things to do and tests that satisfy that user story. Having the user story stand independent because I think that means that the user story will be more. It, yeah, fine. It won't have conclusions of its own, but it will be hopefully something that people who don't necessarily care so much about exactly what we're testing about CNF, we'll actually be able to read it and make sense of it. Yeah, that makes sense. And user stories, and then maybe even surveys that go with the user story, like someone can write up a user story and we can kind of figure out how, how many people, you know, relate or that user story resonates with them and their business and stuff like that. And we can kind of have the, the drive behind the user story, how much agreement we have with it. And then the, these other principles, we can kind of, you know, work at it from both angles. We have certain principles, cloud native principles, so on and so forth. And we say, okay, well, if you're wanting to have this type of architecture and these types of trade-offs that go with this architecture, are they compatible with this user story? No, drop them off. You can't implement it or you can, whatever. I mean, it seems like that, you know, this is a, you know, a cat and, you know, chicken and egg situation, which is, which is fine. Um, but yeah, user stories seem to me to capture everything you're talking about. Which is fine. I, do, I mean, if I, we're coming back to, you know, our repository, my point would be that they deserve a directory of their own, I think, and a process of their own as well. I like I, the idea, Ian, of having um, a whole set of user stories that people can contribute to and, and maybe more than people just being able to find it separately would be people that want to contribute user stories, but don't really know it. They, they're, maybe they have more experience on the user story writing those and less experience on helping with build a best practice or discussing the implementations. Mm -hmm. So it helps with that. I, don't, I wouldn't wanna stop people from getting started. That was the whole point with uh, doing this, which ties in with um, having the user story embedded. But I would say whether yeah, if, someone, if, someone, well, if someone starts a proposal for a best practice, they should, it's, it's required actually before it's gonna make it that they need to tie that to the user story. Yeah. And that can always be copied out. If someone well, starts with the user story, then great, just go but, do the user story. I'm just saying, let's do both and, and we can get started. Yeah, that's fine. Um, if you consider what we have here, we have a Git repo and every Git repo I've ever worked in, you can commit two changes in two files at the same time. So if you've got um, a best practice you wish to recommend against a user story that no one's ever thought of before, you can commit the best practice and the user story in a single change. It, just isn't in a single file anymore, right? You commit the best practice and the reference to it in the user story, but it gives you three options now rather than one. I can commit a best practice based on a user story that somebody else documented. I can commit a user story, even if I don't know what best practices that implies and I'm leaving other people to tell me, or I can commit the whole thing as a, as a chunk and people can review it in that light. Um, whereas what we have at the moment doesn't seem to leave us with quite those options. Yeah, um, you know, I think I see what you're saying. Uh, I see what you're saying. Um, would you want to come up with like a proposal similar to like Robbie's for the user user stories? Um, 
Yeah, I think we can build on Rabbi's patch and we can say, you know, we we take two streams of information. This part is uh, our responsibility is X, this part of our responsibility is Y, and here is the process for both of those things. Um, so if we start there, and then we want a template for what a user story is, including audience and so on, um, which would be the next part of that. Okay, perfect. Is there yeah. a, re would it be all right if we um, get this merge from Robbie in place and then do a new PR on top? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I want to read what Ravi's written a bit more closely before I say yes to that, to be honest. Okay. Well, the, I'd say um, go th everybody that's interested in helping, please go through the PR and let's try to get it merged. We're, we're not trying to get something perfect today or this week and, and it's sitting there. This goes back to the comments earlier about what do we do if there's a best practice that needs to be updated? None of this should be thought of as final. It should all be thought of as we're doing, we're doing what we understand to be best today and we're gonna keep updating it every day going on. But if, if there's something in what's currently there, Ian, that you think needs updated, okay. But ideally we can keep having smaller PRs that get merged sooner. Um, so they're available. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it certainly in the future, that's obviously the case. We're trying to make this so that everybody knows what self-contained change looks like. So that makes more sense. Right now, we're busy defining our outlook on the world. So um, while I think I'm all right with what Rabbi's saying, I want to read it more properly because I don't want it to be, you know, I want to make sure we're getting somewhere in the right direction. Uh, plus, it's got a few spelling mistakes in that want fixing, which is also making me, it's making my OCD go off, so. Sure. Yeah, so I think it'd be great if we can all take the next week um, to review Robbie's PR, and then we can continue the discussion then. Um, so thanks, everybody, for joining today. I really appreciate the discussion, and I think, you know, I really appreciate uh, your idea on splitting the user story um, and the uh, best practice from each other. So thanks everyone. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Ian. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. See you.